cross of Jesus, we see the cost of our sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear, may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. My God, my God, look upon me. Why hast thou forsaken me? Not so far from my help and from the words of my complaint. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season also I take no rest, and thou continuest holy. O oh, the worship of Israel, our fathers halted in peace. Trusted in thee, and thou didst deliver me. They called upon thee, and thou hold. They put their trust in thee, and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no harm. A very stone of men, and the outcast of the people. All they that see me love me to scorn. They shoot out their lips and shake their heads, saying, He trusted in God that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him if he will have him. But thou art he that took me out of my father's womb. Thou wast my hope when I hang it yet upon my mother's breast. I have been left unto thee ever since I was born. Thou art my God even from thy mother's womb. O oh, go not from me, for trouble is hard at hand. And there is none to help me. Many oxen are come about me. At pools of basin close me in on every side. They gape upon me with their mouth. As it were a grumbling and a roaring lion. I am folded out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My God also in the midst of my body is even like melting wax. My strength is dried up like a potter, and my tongue cleaveth to my gums. And thou shalt bring me into the dust of death. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. They took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They replied, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. He responded, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. They answered, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He asked in return. Do you ask this of your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate said. I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked. So you are a king? He replied. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said. What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them. I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They replied, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! But Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They responded, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. 
Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus said, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him. He asked them, Shall I crucify your king? They replied, We have no king but the emperor. Then they handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said I am the king of the Jews. He stated, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Please stand, if you are able. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. 
And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the passion of the Lord. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and for your kingdom, this day and always. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The old spiritual is sung with special feeling on Good Friday. But self-evidently we were not there. Well, we're here now, in church, or at home, or perhaps looking at a phone or a device in some unlikely place. But wherever you may be, we are here together. Why? To think about Jesus in these last moments of his life on earth and to watch the reactions of his friends, his enemies and the ones who couldn't care less. Judas the betrayer, practical Pilate, the mocking criminal, the fearful disciples, the earnest, pious but God-denying religious leaders all saw Jesus hunted down and killed, but could not see. We are there too, and that's important because today is a life-changing day. Today, the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom, and the way is opened to the living God. Each of us has been called by God. So it's reasonable to believe that God has a purpose for each of our lives. For those first disciples, the way of Jesus was to involve tremendous sacrifice. But for those of us whose way is less obviously demanding, his way is still likely to be challenging if we take it seriously. Our calling means we have been chosen, chosen to be challenged, chosen to be changed by God. We know that because it's been the experience of Christian men and women and children down the centuries, beginning with those first disciples at the foot of the cross, in the Easter garden, by the lakeside, and on into all the world. This change that God wants to bring about in us depends on our being thoughtful and attentive to the stories about Jesus. Foremost among them, the words and actions we've been thinking about during Holy Week. 
and especially on this Friday that we call good. Why did Jesus do this or say that? Why did the writers of the four Gospels think such and such an event was worth recording? And where is the inner meaning to be found, the deeper truths to which the outer events are signs and pointers? These are the questions that matter as we try to follow Jesus to Calvary and reflect on his words there. Such a thoughtful response to our calling is a long way from the hard and fast, unquestioning certainties that can prove so fragile in the face of tragedy and the worst that life can throw at us. This was very well expressed to my mind in a sermon by an American Catholic priest, William Bausch. Here's a person, let's say, who's finding their faith very difficult in the face of all kinds of problems. They say, how can I believe in a God who allowed my sister to die of this wretched virus? I say my prayers, but it's like I'm talking to myself. I go to church when I can, I receive communion, but I'm just not sure anymore. So much has changed, so much has happened. Other people seem to turn their lives over to God and smile all the time. I've never had a vision in my life or heard a voice. Doesn't that make me a hypocrite? My response would be, no, you're not a hypocrite at all. You are daring to express very honestly the mystery that is at the heart of true faith. You are on a journey, searching for the God who even to Jesus on the cross could seem to be absent. The stories of Holy Week, indeed throughout the Gospels, are stories about the choices Jesus made the actions he took, the places he went to, the people he hung about with. In page after page, we find Jesus' choices awakening hope in those who had lost it. The choices Jesus made can lead us to reflect on the choices we make. You're probably involved in various activities in church or family or community, perhaps all three. But might you be called to go further, to reach out to people from whom you feel separated by social status or race or faith, by age, criminality, sexual orientation, religious allegiance, in short, to cross whatever barrier that in your heart of hearts makes you feel uneasy. You see, if we search for ways to make a difference, if we go out and look and listen very closely, we shall discover that Jesus has been there before us. Before even it dawned on us to go there, Jesus, who made of himself no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of humanity. Jesus, at the moment of whose death, the veil of division was ripped apart from top to bottom, opening the way to God. My brothers and sisters, the events of Good Friday, as recorded in the Gospels, enable us, readers and hearers, to discover something for ourselves and something about ourselves. Good Friday shows us the connection between the cross of Calvary and the heart of God, a heart that includes all, but especially those excluded within human hearts. His is a heart that forgives and cares and reaches out and longs to heal the wounds of history and those more personal hurts that hold us back from practicing the values of his kingdom day by day. So you see, wherever you may be, and on whatever rung of the ladder of faith, 
what happened on Good Friday is for you. It really matters. That is why the cross, we shall take it. The bread, we shall break it. The pain, we shall bear it. The joy, we shall share it. The gospel, we shall live it. The love, we shall give it. The light, we shall cherish it. The darkness, God will perish it. But that belongs to tomorrow night. The cross of Christ. The cross, the cross of, of the Savior of the world. bishops and other ministers, and those whom they serve. For Christopher, our bishop, and the people of this diocese, for all Christians in our communities, for those to be baptised, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, 
increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry each may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders. For Elizabeth, our Queen, and the parliaments of this land. For those who administer the law and all who serve in public office. For all who strive for justice and reconciliation that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on justice, may be established throughout the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his voice, for greater understanding between Christian and Jew, for the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. children of your covenant, both Jew and Christian. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart, and hasten the coming of your kingdom, when Israel shall be saved, the Gentiles gathered in, and we shall dwell together in mutual love and peace, under the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe the gospel of Christ. For those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost faith, for the contemptuous and scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him, for all who deny the faith of Christ crucified, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful God, creator of all the people of the earth, have compassion on all who do not know you, and by the preaching of your gospel with grace and power, gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Christ our Lord. Let us pray for all those who suffer for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and those who watch beside them that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad, the strength of those who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out of any trouble, and to every distressed soul grant mercy, relief, and refreshment. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commend ourselves and all God's children to his unfailing love, and pray for the grace of a holy life, that, with all who have died in the peace of Christ, we may come to the fullness of eternal life, 
and the joy of the resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation. Let the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection, through him from whom they took their origin, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful God, for the sake of his friends, for the sake of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his son. Lord, Lord I am the Lord Jesus to you. The Lord will save the world, and I shall be healed. The body of Christ. Amen. You receive communion here wherever you are. Reflect on the body of Christ given to you. Pray that his presence with you may comfort your heart and your mind. Oh. Uh-huh. 